Didn't hear you, John. Different time zone, okay. Is Ian in the room? Ian, we need you. So John asked me to introduce Ian Stepler. I think uh, he doesn't need to be introduced if you were here this morning. So it's your show and I'll be, I'll be waving at you when we got 10 minutes to go. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> so this presentation I'm gonna give you during this uh, session is beekeeping in our changing landscape. And this presentation I generally give to farmers and conservation associations just to try to help them understand what we need and what's going on within the landscape and how it's affecting our operation. And some of this is gonna be like old hat for you guys because you know, talk to farmers and they have absolutely no clue on what's going on within our apiaries. They don't even know, they don't know what a swarm is. They, they know there's bees and they've seen bees in a, in a field, but they don't know what's going on. And just some of this I'm gonna present, I'm just gonna present it the same way just to add a f the fluid nature to the presentation, but it's kind of old hat, but it, and farmers find it extremely fascinating. And I just find that when they uh, learn a little bit and they understand a little bit more, they're more apt to think about us with their practices working forward. So in 2018, our farm was awarded with the Pembina Valley Conservation District Award, um, specifically because of our perspective on sustainability as a beekeeper. <clears throat> we have three different enterprises, and they're, they're all separate, but the interaction between the three enterprises is quite unique, and it just provides a little bit of, of a, a rounded perspective I'm about to show you. <clears throat> So with that, I'm gonna talk about sustainability from a beekeeper's vantage point. And to do that, I'm gonna kind of walk through a year within my apiary. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about uh, some of our main industry challenges and then how our farm has specifically approached the issue in kind of like a proactive manner to deal with it. <clears throat> so what's going on, high bee losses? We're all familiar with high bee losses. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of things affecting our bees. Disease pressure, pesticide exposure, nutrition, weather issues, beekeeper management. But I'm specifically gonna talk about how nutrition kind of links every single one of those problems within our hives. <clears throat> <clears throat> So the year starts inside, all the bees are tucked away for winter indoors. I keep them indoors just to, you know, keep them away from that cold Manitoba winter. And as spring approaches, the bees start to get active and they start to want to get out of their boxes. So we start bringing them out, <coughs> excuse me, I bring them out on pallets and forklifts out onto my truck and I move them out at night. Like I was saying this morning, we move them out at night just because they've been inside for five and a half months, right? and they see the first ray of light and they want to fly. So it makes the job a lot easier just to move these honeybee hives outside at night and set them down and set them down into their yard uh, where they can wait for the next day to fly. <clears throat> and I want to show you this again because I just love this picture. And these bees are out flying in the hundreds of thousands. They're flying, taking their first flight. We appreciate that they've been inside for a month and a half. And this is their first opportunity to find a good day to get out and avoid and it just relieves himself. And this point of time is one of those, is one of my favorite points of time in the year. Just this mass spectacle of these bees flying up. It's just, a, I'm in awe the entire time. And it's important that I, as beekeepers, we recognize these moments and we can just step and step back and appreciate it. Because there's a lot about our business that sucks. Like I'm just gonna say, it's uh, beekeeping sucks. <laughs> so we have to be able to grasp these moments in time that we can really appreciate uh, the bees themselves, and then you know just enjoy themselves. Like 
One of the things that gets me through working at night, moving these bees out, is the thought that I'm going to have a moment in the spring to build a stand in this awe-inspiring spectacle is in front of me. Like you, I'm working, it's cold, and it's dark, and I'm tired. And what, gets, what motivates me to get that next load at 3.30 in the morning, to set them down, to do it again the next day, is that moment in time. So I just wanted to point that out to you. It's just one of those points of time I really appreciate. <clears throat> so we're setting our hives out. And end of March, right about this time here. And this is when that winter nest flips itself into a spring nest. It's when they take those old winter bees and they kind of rejuvenate that nest by rearing that spring brood to get them into that spring nest. And to do that, I'm focusing on this time and providing them with everything they need, all the conditions they need to promote a good brood development. So we're going through and we're feeding them with syrup. These are little pails of syrup we're feeding them just to stimulate that queen. Actually, this is a picture from last year. And my colonies were in, it wasn't until middle of April. We get, well, first week, second week of April, we got them out. And these colonies were light. So about a third of my hives were in the state of emergency. They needed feed like right now, so we didn't have time. So we just blanket fed absolutely every hive. Half a pail of feed just to get syrup out, out onto them. Took us, you know, a day and a half, two days, got everything fed up and settled in. That's a gallon pail, yeah, American gallon. So it's not a lot. The one thing about feeding bees in the spring, <clears throat> I can't get my bees to take syrup unless they really need it. So I typically when, they're, when the bees need feed, I'll typically drop frames of honey in to the colony to give them that instant food resource because they have a lot of trouble coming up to take the syrup because it's colder, right? Last year, I didn't have a choice. I had to get the syrup out. The ones that are on the verge of starvation, they could go up and get it if they needed. So it worked very well. Bigger pails in the spring don't work because you fill a big pail up and you get the nighttime, daytime temperature difference and the suction changes and it'll drip, drip and drip and drip in this constant drip. So I use those big pails in the fall and they take the syrup up quick. These small pails don't drip because that difference in the pail that the suction in there is not as dramatic. So they, I can hold half a pail on here all spring if I wanted to. If they didn't need it, they didn't take it. If they need it, they'll take it without any drip issues. So that's what I use that for. <laughs> it's, it's a syrup mixed as a syrup. We pull this, the fructose off the line. It doesn't go to Pepsi, it comes to Be Made. So it comes out of a tanker. It comes to my farm in a tanker. Yeah, as fruit fructose. In the spring, I feed sucrose or fructose, doesn't matter. In the fall, I feed sucrose. In the spring, I'll feed more fructose, high fructose corn syrup. What do you think about two to one? Uh, two to one spring? You're, you're talking about diluted syrup in the spring? Yeah, I know a lot of guys will do that because they're trying to mimic uh, nectar and they're trying to stimulate like that. I don't waste my time with that. If the bees... You know, if they get a little bit of sugar into them and get some protein, they're going, and then they're going to be in the trees bringing in that poplar po uh, nectar right away. So I don't worry too much about that. I used to do that, but then you run into fermentation problems and stuff like that. So I, I just feed them syrup. If they need feed, I give them feed. If they don't need it, they don't take it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we're also feeding uh, uh, protein supplements. We're throwing patties down to stimulate them. And we're feeding the patties to complement the natural pollen that's available. <clears throat> bees need pollen to survive, as we know. Without pollen, these bees aren't going to be, they're not going to develop their nest and they're not going to progress themselves. So I'm feeding the patties to complement that pollen. I'm not trying to feed the, the patties to replace the pollen. They've got it all figured out themselves here. So pollen is, a, is the bee's primary source of nutrients. <clears throat> it's all the proteins, lipids, vitamins, sterols, minerals, micronutrients. It's, it's a superfood. The, the bees are using it to be able to develop out their nests. And every pollen provides a different nutritional value. And like any other animal, our bees require a balanced diet. So here's DeGroote's uh, list of essentials he's got here. This is the ratio that the bees need to build to fully develop their nest. So, you know, you have like one tryptophan to 
four valine, let's say. If, if that valine was three, that throws off this whole ratio, the whole balance, and the bees can only utilize to the first limiting, which would be that three, and it'd be a lot of wasted proteins within there. So it's an unbalanced diet. <coughs> Randy, I said, Randy, how am I gonna figure this out? Because I'm trying to make my patties and I'm getting all this nutritional analysis and nothing shows tryptophan in there because it's expensive to find that value. He says, oh, well, Ian, just rework it. See? So instead of using tryptophan as your first limiting, use histidine. So he redone it here and he did what Randy does is, is he tweaks it and improves it. So this is the ratio that I work on now. This one there, anyways. <clears throat> this graph here is just to show you that every pollen represents a different uh, amino acid profile. So you're not gonna be able to see this, but this is basically showing you all your essentials up here and listing them out and just telling you what is balanced and what is not. So when we look at the balanced profiles, we're looking at poplar, willow, apple, clover, canola, <clears throat> alfalfa. Those are very high, rich feed for the bees to feed on. And then you look at other pollens like sunflower, dandelion, buckwheat, blueberry. Those are unbalanced profiles, so the bees can't fully develop themselves as adequately on, on those uh, pollen sources. <clears throat> so, you know, you sit your hives out and the dandelions flow, and it's just this tremendous growth. These these hives just all of a sudden explode into growth. They're bringing in nectar, they're bringing in all this pollen. But you notice down here, dandelions is a uh, unbalanced profile, and you're thinking, well, that doesn't make any sense. These guys shouldn't be, you know, prospering on an unbalanced pro protein. What's going on? So what's going on is they're taking the huge glut of dandelion pollen, and they're mixing it off of that really high-quality pollen in the background. There's apple there. They're mixing it together and they're balancing out their profile. They're you're utilizing all this protein, balancing it out with the high quality stuff to make a, a tremendous feed. And I kind of think of it this way, you know, go to the buffet and I could eat steak and potatoes every day of my life. So I go up and I load my plate full of steak and potatoes and Sandy's always behind me putting the vegetables and the fruits and just trying to balance out my diet. <laughs> so the bees are doing the same thing as they... Uh, so they mix all the pollens within their environment. So in the spring, the hives are growing, foraging. As beekeepers, we are busy managing our hives to grow at our hives. <clears throat> the bees are busy foraging nectar and pollen to grow at their hives. <clears throat> and I just want to show you this calendar. Excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, the bees stage their growth around plant growth throughout the entire spring. And I, just, and I just like to show this to farmers, just to show them how important diversity is, is within our landscape, within our developing hives. So these hives, they were, we're here. I'm going to put my bees out end of March. And right when I put them out, you know, we have poplar come out, willow, wild plum, maple, those early blooming plants. You know, this is when the the bees take that old winter nest and they're developing themselves into that spring nest. So they're using this really high quality pollen that Mother Nature provides them here to flip their nest into spring. And then they go into the reproductive stage into May when they have this glut of pollen come down onto them. They use the dandelion, the Saskatoon, and the apple, and the pear, and the choke cherry, and the hawthorn, and all this pollen they're mixing together and they're building and developing out their nests so then they can propagate is what they're ultimately trying to do. <clears throat> so during that time, we're feeding our hives patties just to provide that bulk nutrition. We also feed to complement that incoming pollen. We're not feeding to replace that pollen. Um, the bees need that pollen to be able to develop out their nests. <clears throat> and without that pollen, there's that, I, I think of it as being that, you know, factor X. There's that spirit, that natural spirit that the bees need to be able to develop out their nests. And we can't supplement that through feed. We need, even if it's a little bit, a little bit of that natural pollen coming into our colonies, we can supplement it with that. But without that pollen, we, we can't supplement our colonies to get them through two generations. <clears throat> I'm also feeding this uh, just to 
kind of even out the weather events. You know, in the springs, and as these colonies are growing, sometimes they they grow themselves hand to mouth. The pollen's coming in, and they're consuming it, and they're turning it right into brood. And these monster nests are growing. Then all of a sudden, you have a weather event that just kind of stops the foraging for about a week, <clears throat> and it sends these nests into instant starvation mode, instant protein stress. So what these, and that just adds stress because these colonies are going to, you know, cannibalize their brood to be able to find that balance, right, that equilibrium. So we don't want them falling back all the time. We want them progressing the entire time. So we pro provide them with this supplement. We're trying to anticipate these weather events coming through just to make sure they have all those base nutrients they need to be able to keep that development all the way through, even through cold periods. Like I remember back in 2015, we had like a week of snow come down right in the middle of May. But my colonies kept their growth forward because I had enough feed on for them. <clears throat> So this is just a little beekeeper trial that I did last summer <clears throat> where I was comparing supplement to no supplement hives. So I had a yard fed supplement and a yard fed no supplement. And you appreciate there'd be, this is riddled full of errors, you know, this is a beekeeper trial. So this is just trying to help me determine whether or not my actions are actually providing benefit. And what it shows is for the colonies coming out of winter, this is the two, call, the two yards, this is the treatment yard, this is the non-fed yard coming into winter. As I was feeding the treatment yard and no, the non-treatment yard, the yard I fed supplement to grew at 1.8% times as compared to the yard that I didn't. So it, it grew like 12 or 15%. Um, it had that edge, it, it grew that much more. And I found the same in the spring when I was taking the split, that further as it progressed on, <clears throat> the amount of bees I was able to take off the yard I fed supplement was roughly about 12% more than the yard I fed no supplement. Then I got them all evened out in June and I was going to do this great big fancy exciting to see which one produced more honey but I got so bogged down in work that I just you know wiped my table and forgot about it for a while until so I didn't collect any production data but before I put them into the shed I measured them again and sure enough you know both my clusters are 10% larger going into spring or going into winter sorry so what this tells me is the hives are doing very well on their own just with the natural pollen coming in and this also tells me that I'm giving them just a little bit of an edge throughout the spring by providing them the supplement right so I'm not feeding them the supplement to replace the pollen but I'm feeding them just to provide that little bit of benefit to them healthy animal I always figure is a less stressed animal you guys always doing better so maybe it just helps the these bees just handle some of these situations a little bit better. <clears throat> it also last spring was a very cold spring, so the bees were very intermittent when they could go out and collect the pollen and bring it back. They kept getting interrupted with cold weather. So maybe in a good year where they had a steady flow of pollen coming in, maybe this will be a lot, it'll be a lot less different. And I'm, I'm gonna find that out next spring as I continue counting frames just to see what's going on. But as they grow, we focus on building these into new colonies. So I'm always I'm showing these farmers, you know, these colonies are growing, they're using this pollen, this abundance, and we're using all this abundance and this growth and we're making new colonies. So here's Carrie, she's taking some brood frames, she's splitting them off into the nukes. Then I show them this cell, this queen cell, and farmers just love seeing that because I tell them this is, there's not many people see a queen cell. And this is pretty important because this is a virgin that is emerged into the hive, which then goes out and mates come back and then takes over one of these colonies. And it's a pretty special thing. This is, this is very important, very special, very well developed. So at the end of the season, we have like a whole battery of nukes behind me, which I can use for sales. I can use to replace dead spots. I can use to, you know, I don't know what else I'd use them for. Just, you know, make me money. <laughs> And we spend so much time on controlling our growth within our colonies because we don't want them to swarm. And I'm not going to go through the whole story behind swarm. It's, it's interesting and it catches everybody, all the farmers' attention because they just love hearing about it. But you guys know all about swarm, so I won't go too far in depth about this. <clears throat> so we're back to the calendar and we enter into summer. <clears throat> and the fields across our countryside start to flower <clears throat> of alfalfa, of clover, canola, 
The sunflower, just huge abundance of nectar trying to bloom across the countryside. And I have a box per week rule. So once this canola starts to bloom, we're ahead of them by a box just to try to keep ahead of this incoming flow. <clears throat> so I got my guys and they're lifting off the boxes with my cranes. It's all mechanical and these stacks of boxes are gonna come back to be extracted in my honey house. And we'll fill this tank up probably you know, twice a day. There's my grandpa filling barrels. This tank, we, we're cattle, uh, we produce uh, bulls. We sell bulls as a living. And we sell bulls to this guy up in the entry lake. And he, as an old dairy farmer, switched into the cattle farm. And he couldn't pay for the bull that he bought. And his, his bull is already working in his pasture. But I kept seeing this milk tank sitting into his shop. And so I asked him about that. And he said, no, he can't let that go. For, he was out of the business for 20 years, but he polished that damn tank every year. He was just in love with that because he, he says, well, what if I get back in the dairy business? I said, oh, yeah, I told him, oh, I'll give it a good home. I'm going to fill this full of honey. I need something just like this to build to sit in my honey house. So we overvalued it and, and we brought it to my honey house. And he was happy because he paid for some of his bull. And I'm happy because I got, you know, some value out of that bull. <laughs> At any rate. <clears throat> So our landscape literally transforms into trillions of nectar producing flowers. So I did a little bit of stats here. If it takes 550 bees to gather one pound of honey from two million flowers, my 1500 hive operation used 1.5 million bees to collect 285,000 pounds last year from 500, 570 billion flowers. That's my apiary's footprint. So to equate, equate that across Manitoba, which our colony count in Manitoba is 115,000 hives, which annually produces 15 million pounds, we're a 25 to 30 million dollar industry, collected from 8.2 billion bees, which was collected off 30 to 40 trillion flowers across the Manitoba landscape. And that Manitoba honey Poly a bee pollination footprint represents $150 million directly into farmers' pockets due to crop, due to crop production increase, <clears throat> just from that simple act of pollination. This is where we encounter a balance within the countryside of nature and agriculture. <clears throat> agriculture blooms for one month of the year, but it's extremely intense, and that's our honey flow. That's what, that's what we need to be able to keep ourselves in business, is that honey flow. Nature blooms all season long, but gradually and planned out. That's where we grow and develop and maintain our hives. That's where we as beekeepers find a balance within our countryside of agriculture and nature is where we find this tremendous growth and pro prosperity. And it's something our farm takes very seriously as we manage our lands in a sustainable fashion. So agriculture is changing. I don't want to tell anybody here that. There's a lot of research and development in agriculture that's unimaginable to generations before us. There's new technology at our fingertips that actually boggles our mind, like the chemistries and the plant breeding, the GPS and the automation is unlike anything other before. We have bigger, better farm machinery, which are more efficient with more precision. And all this investment in agriculture has allowed farmers to do exactly what farmers do best, is to grow only the crop and nothing but their crops. So it's changed our landscape. I've always argued that it's not the GM technology or the Roundup Ready technology, but it's the use of those technologies as completely wiping the diversity across away from our landscape. Like my brother who manages our grain farm, he, he calls them weeds but I call those weeds bee food. <clears throat> There's no other time in history we have managed our crops paying so much attention towards the individual plant. And chemical farming has allowed us to do this. This is the most important piece of equipment on our farm right now, is a sprayer. More important than a tractor, more important than the combine, more important than the cedar. This sprayer goes all year long. We're, uh, we're using it to manage seed-borne diseases with seed treatments, uh, seeding growth, uh, diseases with fungicides, 
Uh, we're controlling weeds with herbicides, blight issues with fungicides. We use growth regulators for whatever reason. We use timing with, uh, of maturity with desiccants. Um, we're controlling perennial weed problems with post-harvest treatments. This machine is going all the time. <clears throat> and this technology advance has, in effect, allowed farmers to manage losses in a detailed and, expect, and expensive crop protection program. <clears throat> And I would say it's absolutely brilliant. With larger equipment, the fields start to get larger. And GPS, the fields start to get straighter. So we don't want tree rows anymore. We don't want sloughs. We're clearing out the trees. They're starting to disappear, draining sloughs just to make for straighter um, work within our fields. So within this technology, at farmers' fingertips, in a sense, we're managing the natural world out of our production equation. This is a picture of our harvest field. We have three combines going, and it's a pretty busy field. We have these combines going, and we have the grain cart chasing these combines. We usually put the new guy in the grain cart to do that. <laughs> and then we have uh, Adams on the semis, so he's running two semis on that to take the production off the field. And a lot of time we have two swathers going on at the same time trying to keep up to these combines. So at times we have six or seven or eight people in the field working at the same time. And it's really exciting to be part of this harvest crew because the combines are going back and forth and everything is in a process. It's all program and process. Combine goes up and down the field and the grain cart comes and catches it and the combine never stops. My father-in-law is in the combine here. He always jokes that he's got to actually physically has to stop the combine to take a pee. <laughs> Because everything is just a continual motion. It's quite exciting. And it, this job's a lot easier when everything is straight. And when there aren't tree rows to work around and there's no sloughs, it's just straight up and down. That's the most efficient way to farm our fields. Our ability to clear, flatten, and drain land has provided access to lands previously off limits. And we're seeing this within our pastures too. We're losing pastures because guys are able to invest into cheaper property, invest the money into tile, and using equipment as such to improve the lands to be able to farm it. And it's quite, it's quite the advance. We're doing the same thing in our farm. We're improving our lands. We're draining the sloughs. We're making better use of this expensive land to grow our crops. <clears throat> but it's pushing out the pastures and it's pushing out our diversity. <clears throat> Our landscape has transformed. <clears throat> I'll argue farmers have been able to do exactly what farmers were born to do, and that's to improve our lands, kill our weeds, protect growth, and grow big yields. And I'm not saying this available technology is wrong. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's brought the profitability back into our farm and has actually has kept our farm solvent. I am, however, pointing out the problem that is now created. Monoculture is slowly stripping the diversity away from our countryside, and I think farmers are starting to see it too. So I'll come back to this uh, calendar, and I'm just going to exaggerate this whole situation a little bit just to prove that my point as I speak to farmers and conservation groups. <clears throat> in the spring, when we set their bees out and they go out and they start, they want to forage and they want to bring in all this pollen to be able to flip their winter nest into their spring nest. They're going out looking for that highly nutritious pollen and the landscape is pretty scarce. You know, we're having trouble finding it. So these bees are struggling to flip over that winter nest into spring. And in here, where they should be reproducing, they should be growing, where they propagate themselves, they're struggling to find enough feed to keep themselves going. So beekeepers are, you know, How's your hives look this spring? Ah, they look like shit. I don't know. They just something's not right. You know, they just don't look good. Then summer comes on, and you get that big glut of nectar drop onto these hives, and all of a sudden, these hives start to flourish and they start to grow, and the beekeepers get excited and they start stacking boxes on top of their colonies. But by the time these colonies have developed themselves into something actually capable to bring in honey. They're on the backside of the flow, and they're saying, well, shit, I have no honey in these boxes. What's going on here, right? And then it leads into fall here where these hives are setting up their winter nests where they need that pollen to develop these big, fat, juicy winter bees, and they're having trouble finding enough nutrition to actually sustain themselves. 
So nurse, a malnourished animal is a sickly animal. So I can look at that cow, and I can tell you that cow is malnourished. I look at that bee, I can't tell if that bee is malnourished. That's, you know, that's not what our cows look like. We'll just say that's what one of my neighbor's cows look like. <laughs> but I think you get what I'm taking, talking about. Malnourished bees are sickly bees. They're unable to cope with all the stress factors. So they deal with parasites. They're dealing with pesticide exposure, farmer applied, farm applied, viral infections, fungal infections, weather, you know, climate change or whatever that's going on out there, winter, all these stresses influence onto that bee. And because they're malnourished, it's taking them down. <clears throat> We're creating a, an imbalance across our landscape. And as farmers, like, I'm just doing my job. Like, we're feeding the world. This is what we do. I'm a farmer. I understand these pressures placed on us. Like, I sit in that same combine. I look behind into that grain tank, in that combine. And the entire time, I'm looking back there. I'm thinking to myself, like, gosh, there's got to be more grain in that tank. There's got to be a hole in the bottom of that grain tank. Man, I need more grain. You know, thoughts going through my mind. That fertilizer bill is due. I need another drop of fuel. I've got to fix that flat tire in the auger and pay a load of gravel from Colette's and pay, <clears throat> payroll's due on Thursday and I shouldn't up the internet service because I bought that HDTV and the hydro and the phone bill and the water service and land taxes are going to have to wait for another month and I have to make that tractor payment for $23,000 to be withdrawn next week and rent and debt and cash flow and the banker just called again and didn't answer. My youngest daughter is pleading for a horse and horses are expensive and I'm just like, ah, I'm looking back in the back of that grain tank, and that's what's going through my mind every time. Every farmer is thinking the same thing. And it puts me into a bit of a dilemma. My bees need space and diversity of flowering plants. You know, my brother calls them weeds. My bees need nature to exist to sustain colony growth and maintain its growth. My bees need reprieve from continual chem chemical exposure my bees need farmers to farm those trillions of summertime flowers for me to be able to gather in that crop. But my grain farm needs to adapt, adapt the latest technology to glean the efficiencies like the Roundup Ready Tech and such. My farm needs to control the weeds and diseases and insects and population pressures. My, need, my farm needs to manage noxious weeds around the edges. My farm needs to utilize the land and improve the soils by drainage, to increase revenues per acre, just to help us with the cost of our land. <clears throat> so as beekeepers, we need to understand the, farm, the need to farm. But as farmers, we need to understand that nature must exist. So we have to work to find a balance. <clears throat> so what's our farm doing to address this loss of biodiversity within our landscape? Our strategy isn't to, <clears throat> excuse me, we need to farm. <clears throat> we need to be able to adopt the better technology to farm better. We need to grow the crops. So our strategy is to focus around the edges. Focus around the edges, around the ditches, the sloughs, the wetlands, repairing areas, pastures, preserving those little pockets of the natural world right across the countryside. As those little bits of flowers around the edges, that diversity scattered throughout is all we need as beekeepers. The flowers are food, and we have to reinforce this message to farmers that flowers are food. Where there's food, there's pollinators. Pollinators need pollen to survive. And even if it's that, just that little bit of pollen coming into the colonies, we can then take that pollen, that natural spirit coming in, and then we can supplement our hives with feed. So our farm, we hold a large 500-acre ravine of untouched land. It's kept in its natural state. <clears throat> it's hard to farm. We can't farm it, and we don't pasture it because it's pretty hilly. So we just kind of left it as natural space. And many people look at this untouched property as being, you know, it's not yielding anything. It's not very productive. It's got no value to it. 
But this, I would argue, is one of the most productive pieces on my farm, just because of the pollen and the nectar from it to be able to grow and sustain my colonies. <clears throat> it's all the trees and shrubs and berries and all the diversity of life growing within this, uh, within this natural land. <clears throat> <laughs> My cousin doesn't let hunters in there. <laughs> As we manage our lands, we preserve natural waterways and repairing areas. It's very important. Uh, we participate in the Durwood Soil and Water Small Dams Project. And if you'd remember, I told you earlier, our farm's up in the escarpment. And the escarpment's on, that's the, it's the edge, edge of ancient Lake Agassiz and it kind of rolls down to the flatlands of Miami. Every spring there's a huge wash of water that comes down. The elevation difference is two or 300 feet. So we've put together, a, uh, this project's put together a bunch of small dams just to try to help hold back the headwater and prevent the erosion down the escarpment. And it's worked masterfully. And what it's done is just provided all these little wetlands up along the escarpment to provide water. Our bees need water to be able to water our hives. Also just like that natural uh, repair in areas where we can get some of that natural growth. <clears throat> we manage more sensitive lands as pastures where we rotational graze and it also is a place to allow natural plants to flourish. I see an opportunity to promote nat more natural grass within our pastures. So our pastures we divide into paddocks like kind of squared and we rotate them through and uh, we do that basically to promote better grass health and soil health. So what I've done is I've incorporated a bunch of clover in here, not a lot, just a little bit. So we bring the cattle into the pasture, bring them into the pasture, they'll chew down the grass, take the grass first every time, then they'll chew down the clover. We rotate them into the next paddock, and after a rain, that paddock will then regrow itself, and that clover will just rejuvenate itself with flowers. So as we rotate the cattle through all our paddocks, I have this refresh of, canola, or of clover flower all through the season, providing my hives with a continual source of nectar and pollen. This is a pollen was what I'm after. <coughs> we manage our ditches to promote all types of clovers, alfalfas, and wildflowers. This is where I see ditch management as being one of those places where we could focus more attention to establish diversity right across the countryside. We have like a grid, a one mile grid, right across our countryside that I just see limitless potential here to be able to provide that diversity to our bees that we need. And I tell the association groups, I tell the municipalities and farmers, we need more drainage, we need more mowing, we need more attention towards controlling noxious weeds, but we need more, put more attention towards preserving that natural growth. Like quit spraying those ditches, right? Just allow that natural growth to grow. We can manage it, but without, you know, just stop the spraying, just allow that, that, that growth to grow. <clears throat> and this is where I think society can maybe put a little bit of attention towards if they're so concerned about our plight as beekeepers and we're losing our bees to death. If they want to actually do something, they can support efforts to promote natural diversity right across the countryside. And maybe we should be focusing on our ditches where we can maybe promote some more of that. This is like a tangible effort that we can put time and energy into to make a real change. And it's nothing new. Like the Pollinator Partnership, I'm sure all of you have heard about it uh, down in the States here. It's an organization dedicated exclusively towards prom promoting pollinator habitat. <clears throat> One of their initiatives is to develop a pollinator protection plan to work just on, uh, you know, managing our ditches better. <clears throat> I'm, a, uh, I'm particip participating in our University of Manitoba pollinator strip study where they take a strip along the edge of one of our fields and they're kind of measuring the, the, pollinator, the natural, natural pollinator habitat within these strips, within the areas, and just the interaction of agriculture to everything that's going on inside these strips and just seeing how the agriculture benefits and how the, the pollinators within, within the area benefits. <clears throat> And it works extremely well. Like I'm going through after that canola is bloomed, so there's no more bloom in the countryside except for my pollinator strip. And I'm walking through here, 
and it's covered in bumblebees. I couldn't count. There's thousands on thousands on thousands of bumblebees in there, including every type of little wee pollinator, natural pollinator, and my honeybees, all kind of focusing different flowers as they're targeting, gathering that nutrition they need to build to continue their development. And I don't expect this practice to be adopted because, you know, I'm not smoking dope or anything. I don't see this as being practical, but I do see this in the same way I see this. Why aren't we doing the same thing on our ditch management all across the countryside? Just put just a little bit more effort into providing that diversity along the countryside just to provide that nutrition for our bees to, to, to thrive on. So our farm, we're also growing more crops. We're trying to grow more flowers. One of those flowers is sunflowers. We grow a, an oil type sunflower, <clears throat> which doesn't require spraying. So after the canola is done blooming, sunflowers come up into bloom and I can produce a nice healthy little honey crop off the sunflowers and these bees are feeding off the pollen. So it just helps extend my flowering season a little bit longer. And as a beekeeper, I'm also helping myself. I'm also moving my hives around, you know, kind of following the flowers as they bloom. <clears throat> and we're equipped with pallets and easy loader and such. <clears throat> and I'm feeding the bees. As the natural pollen's coming in, I'm also complementing it with this supplement I'm putting on the, on the hives. So the bees are bringing in those little traces, little, little bits of pollen. That's all I need, the natural spirit coming in. Then I can complement that pollen with this supplement just to give them everything else they need, just that glut of protein just to further develop out their nests. <clears throat> and that's basically what I think I'm seeing here in my little trial that I was doing. I'm not seeing like the colonies are managing themselves quite well on their own, but by feeding them that supplement, I think I'm giving them that edge, right? I'm just providing them just a little bit more just to help fill in the blanks, maybe make them a little bit healthier because a healthy animal, healthy guts, it all comes together to a healthy animal. So I think that's why I'm seeing some response here. <clears throat> and as beekeepers prepare for the winter, we need, to, we need those fall pollen plants to provide our winter nests with nutrition. Without proper nutrition, our bees can't fatten up. Just like any other animal that prepares for winter, they fatten themselves up, right, with nutrients just to help them endure long periods of dearth. And this is kind of an exaggerated picture, but hey, here's one, here's an old forager, he's got no fats in there, and here's a nice winter bee that's packed full of proteins and fats and just ready to get through winter. <clears throat> so with all those pockets of flowers across the farm, I fatten my house up real nice. And I'm doing it by complementing it with supplement onto the colonies. And I'm tipping back these colonies in the fall and I'm seeing very nice, well-defined defined winter clusters going into winter. <clears throat> As farmers and beekeepers looking at a changing environment, all I ask is that everybody is to simply make the effort to appreciate and maintain just those little pockets of the natural world to live in. Sustainability takes effort. And if we can just put a little bit of effort into providing those pockets of natural resources, we'll be able to effectively maintain our ecological balance and healthier bees. So thank you for your attention and that I can take questions if you need. <clears throat> So your question pretty much leads me down a really deep rabbit hole. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm not going to be so bold to stand up here and tell you that neonics isn't affecting the bees, because maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. Uh, as farmers, we use these technologies to be able to keep ourselves in business. If it wasn't for those seed treatments, we'd be spraying our crops to be controlling the same problems. So whether or not that problem's underground where we can somewhat manage it as beekeepers, 
or if we broadcast it across the countryside in sprayers every time they go across with the herbicide and blanket everything, like our bees can't get away from that, right? So I'm, I kind of look at the issue as it's a situation that has developed over the last, this farming situation has developed over the last 80 years, let's say, and it's not going to change tomorrow. No matter how much attention we put towards it, it's going to take a long time to change out of this whole situation we've put ourselves into. Maybe it won't change, I don't know. But as a beekeeper, I need, I need to be able to address the problem right now. Right now, right? So I'm, I'm focusing on nutrition. This is why I'm putting so much attention and trying to educate farmers that we need flowers. We need our hives to be better, better nourished. We need this pollen coming in. We need that food for our hives to survive. I'm also uh, providing my hives with nutrition through patties and supplement. So that I'm trying to promote a healthier nest, a, a healthier bee. I'm controlling the diseases in my colonies. I'm doing everything I can as a beekeeper to tr try to promote a healthier bee to maybe be able to handle all these influences out there. If we take neonic seed treatments off the market next year, <clears throat> we might not see any difference in our hive health further down the line because there's a whole other ball of problems there we've got to take care of. So instead of just focusing on one problem of that big ball of problems, I, I feel it's more proactive to focus on more of those problems and try to fix those. And then maybe as we go, as maybe as society progresses and, and we can adopt new technologies to get away from these other harmful technologies, but maybe hurting our bees or in the environment, you know, maybe we'll just naturally progress our way out of that. So does that answer your question? Like as a farmer, I have a bottom line to maintain. You see machinery across the countryside, brand new paint, looks like we're made a lot of money. We're being controlled. We have margins like that, razor thin, and we can't afford to not bring a crop in. We can't afford not to adapt it adopt the technologies to be able to grow these crops. We got to stay in business. Like I can be righteous all I want as a person to sustain the environment, but I'll be out of business. I'll be doing it with a desk job, right? Not as a farmer. So as a farmer, I got to protect my livelihood and I got to make sure we stay solvent. There's no question around that. But as a beekeeper seeing all this, you know, maybe we can influence other, we can influence farmers and in how they farm. Maybe they can farm better. We can promote Research, like these guys were talking last night or this morning, this terrific research, we need more investment into that. And maybe this is a place where society, if they give a damn, they can maybe invest some of our money into providing more research to help us out. Or maybe maybe not even money, but just attention towards our cause, because we, we're directly linked to the environment. And they're ultimately, we want a healthier environment. So let's help, let's help make this a healthier environment, right? So it's, so, I think I just wandered down that rabbit hole. <laughs> so I hope that answered your question. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks for your attention, and uh, we'll touch base later.